I gave this the title from suburbia, the ski bump to succession, because this is pretty much how my career track went. I was a normal student living in, you know, suburbia in Nashville. Um, I was interested in typical things girls are interested in, and it never occurred to me to become a scientist, to have a career. I was mainly interested in playing games and doing what girls do on an everyday basis. So I'm gonna start there. And I'm not moving ahead, okay. One of the favorite things about my house in Nashville was this giant oak tree that was in the backyard. It was kind of my refuge. I loved to go sit out under this tree, be in the shade of the tree. I felt like it was a very special place. So I spent many hours swinging in this tree and uh, enjoying myself and playing in the backyard. Um, but I also realized from the stories that my dad told that this very tree was in some of the records from the Civil War and at that time they had provided shelter for people who were camped under the tree. So I was early on becoming aware of the different services, ecosystem services are the benefits people have from nature um, that can be achieved by trees. But to my horror, when I was in high school, that tree blew down one day. <laughs> we didn't even know how much it was at risk. And what happened when it blew down was the ground was covered with about two dozen dead squirrels who'd been living in the tree. And then it became apparent to me that this tree was a home or the word ecologist uses habitat for many animals that were living in that tree. And the demise of that tree meant their homes, their habitats were gone. So the other interest I had in tree was, I have to confess that one of the first experiments I did was I heard that the only living part of the tree is in that outer layer in the camnium and the interior of the tree, the part we call wood is dead. So I went out to a forest near my house with a knife and I cut not as big as this width, but a small ring around the entire tree because I had heard that if you cut the entire tree all the way around, it doesn't seem like much damage, but it's killing the tree. And to my horror, I came back and that tree died. So this is an experiment that I did because I realized that I was now, I was at that time a young scientist. I wanted to not just believe what I read, I wanted to do experiments and see what the outcome was. And the outcome in this case was a dead tree, which as I said, was not very pleasant to realize I'd killed this poor tree. But experiments is how scientists learn. Um, and sometimes they turn out favorably and sometimes they don't, but it's the evidence that's obtained in that experiment that's important. So in school, and particularly in middle school and high school, what I really cared about was sports. I played basketball and softball, I swam. To me, going to school was an opportunity to be involved in athletics at school, and I had a great time doing that. Um, I, frankly, I wasn't very interested in academics, but I was interested in puzzles, and I realized that mathematics was a puzzle. And to me, solving those puzzles, figuring out what X was, figuring out um, the unknowns was really more fun to me than learning about reading or history or other things like that. I realized later on that the other skills you develop in school, particularly writing, were really important as a scientist. But because I liked math and I felt like it was something I was able to do, it helped me in the long run. Well, I went to a girls' school in Nashville, and at that school at that time, um, they didn't allow girls to take the more advanced science classes like physics, unless you did really well in all of your studies. And as I said, I didn't really like languages. I, in high school, I had three years of French and two years of Latin, and I didn't do very well in them. So my teachers assumed I wouldn't do well in the sciences, so I wasn't allowed to take them. But I was allowed to take all the mathematics I wanted because they assumed nobody would want to take math. And I actually thought it was fun. So that led me to a career in mathematics. Um, and in college, 
when I chose a major, I chose math and I'm skipping ahead. When I got to college though, I was really kind of bored because it wasn't um, intriguing to me. And a number of my friends who graduated before me decided to go out west and become ski bums. And I was sitting there thinking, do I really want to study things when I don't know why I'm doing it? Or do I want to become a ski bum? So I dropped out of school and I went and became a ski bum. I got an, a night auditor job, so I kept the books. I had to add up all the records for the day of this hotel, bar, and restaurant. And if I didn't make any mistakes, I got to sleep a little bit and I woke up for the, sh well, I got to sleep and then, and then wake up everybody else up in the hotel. And the chef at the hotel then would bring me a wonderful breakfast and I would rush out and catch the first tram up and got to ski all day. So I didn't get much sleep during that time because I was up most of the night um, doing the books and I was skiing during the day. But when you're 20, you can do things like that. But I realized that's not what I wanted to do with the rest of my life. And when it came chances to think about where I did want to go, as a native Tennessean, I realized that going back to the University of Tennessee was my best option. If you can believe it, I worked at McDonald's for two weeks and earned my tuition for the semester in those two weeks. <laughs> so I, my parents were not thrilled with my um, actions of dropping out of school, becoming a ski bum. And um, I was pretty much paying my own way at that time. And um, this is the building, Ayers Hall, that um, is still the math department and was at that time. And I was able to, um, uh, stay there and get an undergraduate degree. And then through Oak Ridge National Lab, I was invited to do a master's in mathematics because I had taken a class that was required. You have certain requirements in college. You have to take certain distribution of classes. I had to take a science class. I chose ecology. And the professor at one time mentioned mathematical ecology. And I thought, wow, that is something that I could really do. And so I went to a professor, asked him about it. The upshot of this was I took a class he was offering and Oak Ridge National Laboratory said, we're interested in students who want to combine math and ecology and they offered to pay for my master's. So all of a sudden it was the easiest thing for me to do was to go to graduate school and get a master's. And that really wasn't in my plans. I was just moving from day to day, but it turned out to be excellent. From UT, I went to the University of Washington and ended up devising my own program in mathematical ecology to get a PhD. And for that, moving quickly ahead, I chose a study of pollination ecology, not because I was particularly interested in pollination per se, but it was, a, it was an important field at the time. And it was one where I could do the field work and develop a mathematical model of pollination interactions. Plus, I must admit, I got to work in one of the most beautiful places in the world. This meadow on Mount Rainier is where I did my field work. So I was able to prove to myself and to others that not only could I do the mathematics, but I could do the field work associated with ecological studies. And that has been very important. And as I pursue my career, I try to do both the math, the modeling, the statistical analysis, but also understand what's happening in the field because it's the observations that we make in the field that really drive our understanding and development of models and analysis that come from the field we're studying. So it happened that I was in Seattle at the University of Washington um, and about to finish my degree in 1980. In fact, I gave my defense of my thesis on the very day that Mount St. Helens began its initial eruption. And this is what Mount St. Helens looked like um, in 1979. And what happened with the eruption was there was a dramatic seismic activity that began on the day I gave my thesis. And uh, a couple of months later, the whole mountain um, erupted. And this very dramatic eruption was exciting to all of us who were in the area. Interestingly enough, in Seattle, we got very little impact of it because most of the eruption went to the east and we were situated north. It also 
was exciting to us as an ecologist, we basically had a proposal already written before the mountain exploded. Of course, the eruption ended up changing things in very different ways than we anticipated. But I was quickly able to get involved in work at Mount St. Helens and in fact was um, on the first team of biologists who helicoptered into the area to try and figure out what was gonna be important from an ecological point of view to understand, to, to predict changes and to help the people and the organisms that were in the area. So this is a picture with the mountain in the background of the debris avalanche deposit, which ended up being the area I focused on. This is the largest landslide in recorded history. And if you remember what the mountain used to look like, what this area is, is basically the summit of the mountain that slid down to the Tudor River Valley that we're looking at here. And over time, this area has eroded very much. In the first years, the river wasn't even there. And it finally emerged and uh, formulated itself. So what we are studying is what is called primary succession, that is succession, um, uh, the change of plants and animals over time. And it's primary because there were no surviving organisms over much of this area. Um, what we did was we established permanent plots and 40 years later, we're still monitoring. In fact, Suzanne, I didn't tell you this, but I was supposed to be out there right now, but because of COVID, our field season for this year has been canceled. So we're gonna have to do the next sampling next year instead of this year. And I've had a team of researchers working with me over the 40 years. At first we visited these plots every year, but now we go back every five years and we do things like this is a seed trap the team is establishing that we put sticky mesh up on and then trap seeds so that we can observe what's happening out there. We monitor all the plants and look at changes in the number of plants and the number of species and in um, the size of those plants and in the biomass, which is the amount of biological material that's out there and have um, developed models of how these can change through time. So it's been fascinating to me to be able to have this 40 year experience and to be able to be in Tennessee, which as I said, is my home state, but go back to Mount St. Helens every once in a while to continue my research there. I love this picture. It's my favorite one because it shows how excited we were when we saw the very first seedlings that were coming in. In the first years, there was nothing there. And so when some biological actions started happening, it was quite exciting. Now, as we do our work, we're actually standing under the shade of um, trees and are watching the diversity increase over time. One of the interesting phenomena that happened was that um, we were able to look at effects of management. You can see I'm standing out there in the olive covered, covered um, helicopter outfit with a with the helicopter pilot in yellow. And this was about 1984. Right after the eruption, there was great concern about this material that was newly laid down in this largest landslide in history and whether it was going to road down to impact people living downstream. And so um, the Soil Conservation Service learned that if they applied for money, they could get emergency money up to a million dollars in the first six months, but they had to apply for it and spend it within the six months. And so what they decided to do was to obtain seeds and seed much of the area with, um, it, it turned out being non-native seeds because that's what they have. These are the same seeds that are spread along highways. Um, and they did this. And to my uh, chagrin again, I was out on the debris avalanche deposit when the helicopter came over. So I was seeded upon with these seeds. And I, so I knew exactly where they fell on the day. And they didn't, because we had, um, complained, a large group of ecologists had complained, they didn't see the entire area, but they did see part of my permanent plots. So 11 out of the um, 103 plots got seeded upon, and over time we've been able to follow this and see that it, the seeding had a negative effect on the native trees that were coming in. More of them died in the 
uh, seeded area than not. And we think that's because there was a big mouse outbreak when all these grasses started coming in. The mice were eating them, then in the winter, there wasn't much to eat and the trees were under a layer of snow. So they ended up ringing the trees, much like I did my ringing of tree experiment as a child. So that experiment kind of foreshadowed what these mice were gonna do on the debris avalanche deposit. Still, we see some of the effects of this seeding some uh, 40 years later. And that's one of the questions that we're still asking is how this early intervention um, that I should say really had no impact upon erosion at all. Um, erosion is a problem and still is a problem, but it did spend up to a million dollars and um, has a long-term effect on the ecological recovery that's going on in that area. Um, <clears throat> so I've been interested a, a lot in the interactions between disturbances like um, erosion that you see here and the vegetation. There have been outbreaks of herbivores um, and road building and other kinds of activities. And this is one of the things that I've been able to continue studying over time. Um, I should also say that as a scientist, you don't just study it, you have to produce the results. And so I've been involved in editing two books that have come out of the Mount St. Helens area. So these books include not only the results of my research, but also the results of um, a large number of scientists who are working in the area. And it's great that we have these results available and allows us to work together and think about um, synthesizing what's happening in these different types of disturbance areas. If this is where I really regret I'm not with you, <laughs> because if I were, I would bring a cake. Um, every anniversary of Mount St. Helens eruption on May 18th, I make a volcano cake. And if I go to give a lecture, I will bring the cake with me. So this shows three of our cakes. And what's important about these cakes is that they depict the geological events as well as the ecological events. And um, one fifth grade teacher told me that her students had more fun talking about the cake and looking at it than eating it, which I can't believe, but that's what you're gonna have to do now. We don't get to eat it. The way I make the cake is that the bottom layer is uh, strawberry and that represents the magma, which is underneath the surface. And then the next layer is a chocolate cake which represents the soil. And then I use a bunt cake, you can see this better in the bottom cake <laughs> picture 2014, um, to represent the volcano. And I pull out a part of it because the way the volcano erupted was to the north. And so only a part of it came out and then the blast went upward. Um, in actuality, Mount St. Helens didn't have much lava, which is above ground magma. Um, and was what you think of often with volcanoes, particularly the Hawaiian volcanoes, which is the red material. I always put a lot of lava in that is strawberries because I like them so much, <laughs> but I am not accurate in that. And you see each of these have white on the top because some of the glaciers on Mount St. Helens are still there. Now, again, in the 2014 cake, you can see um, what are the um, pretzels which represent the trees that were blown down and these appear like um, pickup sticks and they're still there. And some of the photos I showed you earlier, they were in the background and I didn't make it clear. And you can't see, but I have gummy worms and gummy fish and gummy bears buried in the cake because a lot of animals were killed during the eruption, unfortunately, but they're coming back. So now we have gummy butterflies that we lay out on the top. In the 2015 picture, you can see some of the butterflies on the bottom left, and we have vegetation coming back as represented by these herbs that you see. So that entire thing is edible, but it really represents the geologic and the ecological processes that are occurring. And I have found that making edible depictions of events is very helpful for remembering it. So maybe you can make a volcano cake yourself. My grandkids love making these volcano cakes and have a really good time with it. And I regret I cannot share it with you. My apologies. Um, but as I mentioned, I started getting interested in disturbances. And when I came to Oak Ridge National Laboratory, um, 
they let me, allowed me to do some of the research at Mount St. Helens, but they were also interested in all kinds of effects of disturbances on communities. So the, um, the leftmost photograph shows a fire that's going through a longleaf pine forest. And although we call this a disturbance in an ecological sense, it's really a natural part of these longleaf, fire, longleaf forest interactions. Um, the fires naturally are started by um, lightning, like I'm having now at my house, um, or um, activities like that, really lightning. And they're very low level. If you see this low level fire, we could actually step over it. it. It moves very slowly through the forest and it doesn't hurt the large trees, but it takes out the, the smaller trees and are very important for allowing habitat to exist for um, red cockaded woodpecker, because if we didn't have these small fires, the, the small trees would allow snakes to get up in the canopy and the snakes then eat the baby woodpeckers. So the picture on the right is one of my favorite photographs. It's a picture of an endangered species biologist, but he's shooting, he's, he's sitting on a vehicle that's a flame shooter. He's shooting flames out the back and going through the forest as fast as he can to light the forest on fire. And this is not what you think of as an ecologist doing, but this was his job. He told me he woke up every day and thought, can I start a fire today? Because there are many days when you can't. And that was his job to burn low level fires to protect the forest and the organisms that live in it. And then I started becoming interested in sustainability. This is a cartoon that we had drawn up about 1985 or so. And it depicts what people used to think about in terms of forest. On the left, you see a forester and he's got a chainsaw and he's thinking about the money that he's gonna make. And on the right, you see an ecologist and this person has binoculars and a big heavy book and he's thinking about the birds and the bees and they were literally on the opposite side of the tree. But now we're realizing that sustainability requires both. You need to have some um, benefits to nature, habitat for the organisms, but you can provide those benefits by making money from the forest and managing the forest in a way that provides natural benefits, economic benefits, and social benefits in terms of jobs um, and beautiful places for people to live. So, so the sustainability perspective really brings together all of these and doesn't put us on opposite sides of the tree, but tries to have us work together. Um, so at Oak Ridge National Lab, we got involved in how to quantify and assess sustainability of different renewable energy options. I've spent a lot of time thinking about bioenergy, which is using biological material to replace um, fossil fuels. Ethanol is um, one of the common products. So when you go to the gas station and you can put ethanol up to 10% in your gas, your, in your gas tank, you're actually uh, not using fossil fuels that come out of the ground. And in Europe, they're much more advanced in using um, bio-based materials to replace fossil fuels. And big advantage of that is any of the fossil fuels that come out of the ground are basically fossilized material that are not a part of the atmosphere. Um, and we're introducing new material that's contributing to climate change. And if you're using biological material, it's already a part of the above ground systems and we may be affecting the rates a little bit, but we're, it's much more beneficial in terms of climate change. Oops, I jumped ahead. So when Suzanne introduced me, she said I was a landscape ecologist and I didn't see any, I can't see the questions right now, but I didn't see anybody ask what that is. <laughs> but I'm gonna tell you, um, from a landscape perspective, you look not just at one particular place, but you look over an entire area and think about um, benefits and costs that are achieved over that area. So I really like this um, depiction of landscape design for bioenergy sustainability. It's thinking about where people live, recycling that occurs, material that is used to put into our cars, to heat our buildings, um, effects upon carbon dioxide and therefore global climate change and integrating all of these together. And so one of the key questions as a landscape ecologist is to think about the appropriate scale for considering questions 
and making sure that humans are a part of the system because there's no place at all on the earth now where human impact um, is not prevalent. Um, so when we think about trees and the benefits and sustainability, we can think about the benefits that are in carbon sequestration that, she, that trees have as they grow. Um, about half of the material in them is carbon. And water purification, when water runs through forest, it's, it is clean. Jobs, um, and as I mentioned before, habitat for organisms, um, products like uh, paper and wood that we use. There are a lot of benefits to forests and a big need to maintain them and manage them appropriately. Um, one of the fun things I did was sponsor a study tour on wood-based bioenergy because, as I said, a lot of Europeans are using this bioenergy and are talking about effects upon U.S. forests, but they don't really understand U.S. forests. So we had people from 13 different countries that we put on a bus in Oak Ridge and we rode over four days down through um, Georgia, a little bit into South Carolina, um, and back into Georgia, all the way to Savannah, um, and talked about forests, talked to the forest landowners, talked to the loggers, visited a um, bioenergy mill. And along the way, on the left, we had a high school student who was um, very active in learning about forest systems come and talk to us and talk to us about his perspective on forests. The, the, the man and the woman in the middle are um, two college students who were also involved in educating and learning about forest and they talked to us as well. And then the guy on the lower left standing there with me, I've got on the vest that says Tennessee. I don't know if you recognize this old guy, but he is the keyboard artist for the Rolling Stones. And he, his wife is a landowner in Georgia and he is an award-winning forester because his hobby is um, conducting forestry in a sustainable way. And he came and joined us as well, because as he said, Nick and the boys were playing nearby and it was, it was okay for him to spend the afternoon with us. So that was pretty exciting for, um, all, particularly the Europeans were really excited to, to meet a member of the Rolling Stones band. So they were all kind of rock stars, as I say there, referring to the high school student and college students, as well as uh, real rock stars. Um, and as we started talking about sustainability and energy um, and using bio-based materials, we realized that a lot of the ideas that we were applying to um, production of biomaterial, forests and um, grasses in the United States applied to agriculture. And so a group out of Mexico asked us to think about how sustainable agriculture could be done better in the Yaqui Valley of Western Mexico. And so we went out and conducted field work, but a lot of what we did was meet with the landowners and the farmers in the area, as is shown in the bottom um, picture. And these meetings involved us talking about what we thought sustainability meant from a US perspective, and then allowing the Mexicans to really correct and adjust our understanding so that we came away with an understanding of what was important to them in terms of sustainability. So for example, we came in saying uh, effects on climate change of agriculture are really important, but from a climate change perspective, the actual changes that were occurring, the droughts that were occurring, were really affecting their ability to grow produce, which is largely wheat um, in this area. So they were seeing the effects. So we we ended up working with them and modifying our understanding and coming up with a more generalized understanding of what sustainable agriculture is needing. And um, we've tried to test this and apply it to different places of the world. So one of the places we went were the highlands of Guatemala, as shown here with these adorable children um, that uh, were pleased to be in a photograph with me. This is a, an amazing area. It is really steep, rich soils. The people are very deprived of opportunities. Um, you can see there's an outhouse in the back. They don't always have running water available, but we're trying to work with a group that's providing running water as clean water 
as well as a way for them to improve sustainability of their systems, which largely means getting seeds that are adapted for the changing disturbance regimes because new insect pests are becoming prevalent in the area. And a lot of it's going back to their traditional agricultural needs as well because um, these farmers really know what they're doing and when they try to um, use some modern advances that are used in high-end agriculture, they don't apply to these small fields. These fields are about an acre in size, but are very intense. Um, so I've had a lot of fun learning about that. And the other aspect that we did, this is a picture of our house in Knoxville, where um, Keith, my husband and I live, and we did a lot of things to make this house be more sustainable. So. So there was an article written that was the house that science built, trying to make a cute title for that. And we did things like, um, you see the wood post that my hand is on, that is actually from an oak tree that was on our lot. We had to cut down the oak trees because we put in um, geothermal energy. And so we had to cut down a fair number of trees, but we used those trees in building the house. And Keith has his hand on the railing and those, that wood, and much of the wood and um, throughout the house came from uh, my church, which was being torn down to build a new Kroger. And they had just built a new sanctuary, which was beautiful. And we salvaged much of the church's wood and put that into the house. So throughout the house, we have pieces of glass from a Chinese restaurant. We have um, the wood from, from various resources. We use local rocks, we use local material. And as I said, it, it is largely run on geothermal and being as energy efficient as possible. So we are trying to model what we're um, studying. My, Keith is, is an energy scientist and trying to learn about being more energy efficient. And we realizing that it's not only the way we build the house, but the way we live in it. So we try to use our porches as much as possible and we don't cool our house as much as some other people would, but it's behavior as well as materials, as well as how the houses are built to make them more sustainable. And so that's been fun for me to learn about um, how to do things better in my personal life. Um, I wanted to tell you about this uh, part of my professional society that's called the Ecological Society of America. Its motto is no child left inside which I think is wonderful because too many times um, people, children, adults, aren't getting out and learning about the natural environment as much as we should. Um, the Ecological Society of America has published a series of articles on careers in environmental scientists. And I wrote an article about um, working at national labs, which have a formal name of federally funded research and development centers. And I have found that for people to be successful in working at national labs, um, there are two key things, um, an interest in developing new ideas and applying them as well as working with a team. None of the scientists at Oak Ridge National Lab or any of the other labs work by themselves. They're always working in a group, which I find to be very stimulating as well as the ability to communicate effectively. Remember how I'd said that English wasn't my favorite subject, but it's actually very important to have skills to, to be able to write effectively, to be able to talk and to be able to communicate. So in my mind, those are two of the skills that are um, available in terms of working in a national laboratory. And I found it a great opportunity because I really like doing the research and I like interacting with students and through the labs association with the University of Tennessee, as well as other schools, I've been able to interact with uh, students throughout my career. So kind of in summary, um, I wanted to mention uh, what has been important, I think, to um, having uh, an interesting career that meets my needs. And one was having strength in an area. For me, that was mathematics. For someone else, you know, it might be um, botanical knowledge. It might be knowledge about geography and computer systems. Serendipity is also important, chance. And I was pretty lucky to be at 
the University of Washington when Mount St. Helens blew up. And because I was flexible, I was able to take advantage of that opportunity and change direction brought quite quickly. Um, having a broad perspective, which is what a landscape ecologist does, is very important. Persistence is critical. I've heard no a lot of times, and when I hear, you can't do that, I usually think, oh, yes, I can, and try to pursue it, but also having fun. If you're not doing something that is engaging to you, then I just think it's really would be hard. My son asked me one day when he was about the sixth grade, and he said, um, what would it be like if, if you um, liked going into your job every day? And I said, what would, what would it be like if you didn't like it? Because that is unimaginable to me, to have to go into a job every day that you thought was boring, unfun, not important. So I encourage you to think about what is fun for you and try to find a career that takes you along that path. There are lots of different directions to go in. So I wanted to tell you a little bit about my family because that's so important to me. Um, in the top picture, I'm on the left, but my daughter is on the right. She works in environmental policy in um, Washington, D.C., working to protect um, our native lands. And this is pictures of her two children. On the right, Lily, is helping me explain volcanoes to her first grade class. And would you know, my two granddaughters are both big skiers starting at three, three years old. And here they are going up a, a tram to go skiing. They're pretty avid skiers. Um, my son is an aerospace engineer and is having fun designing um, satellites. And again, he's the one who said, what if it wasn't fun? And now he's having a good time because he has um, an engaging career where for him, he gets to design aspects of the satellites, but he also gets to go into the workshop and help build them. So he works for a small company that allows that diversity, which is really good for him. And then finally, I wanted to end with this poem. You've probably heard the poem by Joyce Kilmer. I think that I shall never see a poem as lovely as a tree, a tree whose hungry mouth is pressed against the earth's sweet flowing breast. A tree that looks at God all day and lifts her leafy arms to pray. A tree that may in summer wear a nest of robins in her hair, upon whose bosom snow has lain, who intimately lives with rain. Poems are made by fools like me, but only God can make a tree. I always thought that was kind of a sappy poem. And um, one of my English teachers loved it, and I thought it was really crazy. But recently I found that there is a Joyce Kilmer Memorial Bad Poetry Contest. And so I have developed an entry, which I never have submitted, but I wanted to read my entry to you. It's, I know I've seen so many trees with values as diverse as these. In proper place, a tree provides shade and shelter for critters to hide, enhanced carbon sequestration, air and water purification, improved water infiltration and disturbance modification, as well as human recreation. Forests are studied by scientists like me, but all appreciate forest and trees. So that kind of sums up my philosophy and the fun that I have in doing my work. And I thank you for listening and um, invite you to ask any questions you may have. So I uh, will uh, read, read uh, some of these questions. And uh, one of them is, can you give a few examples where you use mathematics in a research project? Oh, gosh, I use mathematics in almost all of my projects. Um, uh, there, <laughs> there's so many. So I'll tell you about one that I haven't even mentioned at all. And that is trying to understand deforestation in the Amazon. So um, I worked with um, some graduate students and we developed a mathematical model that predicted changes over time in the Amazon of Brazil. And when we did this model, we had kind of three scenarios, you know, a worst case, a better case, and a middle case. And we ran the projection over about 100 years. And then we went and collected data 
by talking to the farmers in the area to see which of these model projections um, was most accurate to what was going on. And to our horror, we found out it was the worst case scenario that was closely matched with what was going on out there. And the characteristics of that was that um, people used fire. In the best case scenario, they, they hardly ever used fire to clean their land, but these farmers used fire. Um, they typically grew only one crop. In the best case scenario, they had multiple crops, including nuts from the forest and, and um, fish, as well as um, crops that they grew. So we used a model to make predictions and then match it up to the data and then look at the characteristics of the model to understand how that fits with what is observed. And this is the kind of analysis that we often do is make a model and then test it with what is going on in the real situation. It's a good question. Okay, here's a, a, another question. Um, is it true that the glacier inside the cauldron of Mount St. Helens is one of the few that is growing? You know, I don't know the answer to that. It's not really, it probably is growing and it's not really inside the cauldron. It's, much, it's on top and it could very well be growing because of the large amount of rain that, and therefore snow that is, um, occurs in Washington state. It, it has um, very low elevation mountains. The rain and snow currents that come off the Pacific deposit a lot of material. So I will check that out, but it makes sense that it might be. Okay, thank you. Um, this is another question. Um, this is from Eric Carr. I enjoyed your Civil War photograph. Prior to the Civil War and afterwards, look at the forest 150 years post clear cut. What temporal scale considerations effect should we take into consideration in looking at our forest and landscape today? Okay, Suzanne, you got cut off in the middle of that. Are you asking? Oh, sorry. Did I, I'm sorry. Yeah, ask it real short. Sorry, I, I don't know. know. That's a good question. Uh, uh, so I just blinked You're out. You're saying in, in 150 years, what? Yeah, yeah. So 150 years after the forests were clear cut, you know, what what of temporal and and effects should we take into consideration looking at the forest today? Okay. Well, I'm going to talk about the southeast forest because that picture was taken in the southeast, and I know much more about the southeast, and it's kind of pertinent to where we're living. When you look at um, patterns of disturbance in the southeastern United States, about 200 years ago, much of this area was cleared for agriculture um, and also for, for energy because energy at that time was wood and wood, people were burning wood to heat their homes and also wood was often used in trains. But what happened was that the Corn Belt, places where we grew a tree, tree where we grew agriculture moved to the west or the midwest to Illinois and Iowa and so um, we aren't growing as many crops as we did here 200 years ago so now the forests are coming back but um, we are subject to a lot of disturbances in these forests um, canes, tornadoes, um, insect outbreaks, droughts but the really big pressure on forests that we have now is um, development, suburbia is what we're returning to, um, suburban homes, um, urban areas expanding. Raleigh, North Carolina is the fastest expanding city in the United States by some measure and has lots of forest around it. But as the city expands, um, you're losing uh, trees. The forests that are 150 years um, old and older um, have large trees when they're intact, they support species that you don't see in other places like the red cockaded woodpecker I mentioned earlier, and um, are wonderful places to go hiking because they're cool this time of year. They have a lot of shade. The one question here is simple question is, where did they clear the forest? Okay, who are the they we're talking about? Do you have any idea? I, I assume that that means it's the Civil War when they cut the, I don't know, if the, if the person uh, who said that wants to talk, I can change, I can try Yeah, to. you can elaborate on the they because, you know, people have been clearing forests all over the world. Um, in the Amazon, well, how about the, uh, the person that put that in? Do you guys want to say something? I, uh, 
opened your mic, um, maybe. Um, uh, no? Where did they clear in the Civil War? Oh, in the Civil War. Um, they, they cleared in the Civil War partly as part of the battlements, um, as the battles that, that, that were occurring, they would um, dig in certain places. But um, the forests there were a challenge for people to go through because they had to know where they were going. And they mainly used established pathways. And when battles were fought in the forest, um, the trees were um, not affected so much, um, except when digging occurred with these um, uh, protective areas that people um, got in, like foxholes. Okay. Are there any other questions? Uh, okay. Well, um, we really thank you for this extremely interesting talk, and we really appreciate it. Uh, I don't know if anybody, people can actually, uh, uh, you know, clap or say something, but anyway, thank you very much. Well, thank you. I hope you guys all have interesting and important lives. Thank you.